Hello, hello everyone. I see people are coming in. We'll just wait a few minutes for people to come in and get settled. Welcome, welcome to the webinar. Welcome to today's session. All right, just a few more minutes to let some people come in. Okay, welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is Leave a Mark, Legacy Society Events That Make an Impression. This webinar is sponsored by the Endowment Management Program of the Episcopal Church Foundation. This is the first in a three-part series on endowment growth. My name is Juliet Acker, and I am the Program Director for Business Development in the Endowment Management Program, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin the webinar, a few tech details. This webinar is being recorded, and we will send out the recording after the webinar. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Please put your questions in the chat below. In the chat, not the Q&A. So the chat box below. Everyone is muted and will stay muted throughout the webinar. All right, without further ado, let's meet our presenter for today. Our presenter is Josh Anderson of the Endowment Management Program. All right, Josh, over to you. Thanks, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, not seeing a full listing of who's in the room right now, but I did take a look at the registration list, and I was pleased to see so many names uh, that I recognize from the uh, many years of working with so many of you on your endowments um, in, in the relationship that you've developed with the Episcopal Church Foundation. Um, this afternoon's webinar, as Juliet said, is the first in a three-part series that we are launching today focused on endowment growth, and today's webinar is going to be focused on legacy societies, um, and we're going to be hopefully sending you away with some wonderful ideas that you might consider putting in place uh, in your own uh, faith community, wherever you may be serving or working at this time. Um, so before we move into some ideas, I just want to set the stage a little bit and give a little bit of context for where we're going to be going. Um, and do just a little brief introduction. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about legacy societies. We'll do a little introduction to legacy societies in just a moment, but we're also going to be talking about some of the challenges that come up with legacy societies. Um, many churches, dioceses, uh, schools, and other organizations may have legacy societies, but they also may be facing uh, challenges in sustaining or maintaining momentum with those legacy societies as they continue to kind of of grow and uh, become a part of the fabric of your uh, own uh, faith community. Um, with that, we're also going to talk about some opportunities that may be available to you to rethink how you talk about your legacy society. Um, we're also going to be revisit. Uh, we're going to be visiting some strategies. Uh, hope walking. Hopefully, you will walk away with some concrete ideas that you can begin to think about putting in place in your own local setting. And then at the very uh, very end, we'll just take some brief time to talk about some of the tools and resources that are available to Episcopal faith communities through the endowment management program of the Episcopal Church Foundation. Um, we may, at the end, as Juliet said, have some time for some Q&A, but we are also trying to keep this to a short webinar, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are mindful of your time and, and staying on track with that, um, with that expectation. So if we do not get to those Q&As, we will certainly record them and respond to individuals um, at, as is necessary. So without further ado, I just want to take a brief moment to just talk a little bit about legacy societies. What are legacy societies? Um, the purpose of a legacy society is really to recognize and thank individuals who have made a provision in their estate plans or, and this is a caveat that I think also doesn't get talked about very much with legacy societies, we at the Episcopal Church Foundation, we really encourage churches to include folks in their legacy society who have made a current gift to their endowment fund as well. Legacy societies don't have to focus solely on death and dying. We can also encourage 
people to make endowment gifts while they are living and thank them for that gift as uh, by inviting them into the legacy societies that we establish in our own communities. Um, and really, as I was saying, legacy societies are the way that we say thank you to those individuals while they are living. Um, they are also really the vehicle for ensuring the future mission and ministry of your faith community. Um, there are lots of benefits to having a legacy society in place um, in your church or other uh, other faith community. Um, one being elevate your donors. You, as we were just saying, you want to celebrate and thank them for their gifts and keep them excited about the wonderful things that their gifts are going to enable. It also demonstrates to potential givers um, that they too will be honored um, and invited to become a part of this legacy society. It strengthens the bond. So those who have left a planned gift to your congregation, they already feel clearly a real connection with your organization. Um, they've promoted you to the status of family in their estate plan by making that provision. Um, a legacy society, it reciprocates that by acknowledging them in a special circle of your organization's families. Um, this is a group of individuals who care deeply about your future mission and ministry um, so much that they've made provision to provide for that future and uh, future mission and ministry beyond their own lifetime. Legacy societies are a great opportunity for witness. Um, so when someone makes an estate provision for your church uh, and they count themselves as a member of your legacy society, they are not just receiving recognition from you, but they are giving witness to their faith through the, through the church. They're following the leadership and witness of those individuals who came before them um, and hopefully inspiring others in your congregation to do so as well. It also helps you to stay in their mind. Um, they help you to keep a connection between your organization and, and those donors. Um, losing that connection between donors and your organization risks losing that gift. Um, uh, the most common types of planned gifts that people are going to make, those are often revocable. Um, so making sure that you maintain that connection and keeping, um, keeping yourself in their mind uh, as that relationship continues to grow and develop over the years. Real quick, we have a couple of poll questions that we're going to do throughout here to gather a little bit of data. Um, we always love to hear from you and as much information as we can get, it helps us to uh, improve our services, think about how to expand what we're able to do and how to best serve uh, Episcopal faith communities. So uh, you should see popping up on your screen here in just a moment, a quick poll question, uh, which just asks, it's a yes or no question, or an I'm not sure if you're not sure, but does your faith community have an active legacy society? And we'll take about 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds to have folks respond to that um, question. So I'm seeing lots of responses come in. Wonderful, wonderful. So it looks like just about everyone has responded and it looks about like 60% of the uh, folks on the call today do indeed have a legacy society in place in their congregation. 37% of you do not have a legacy society in place. And there are a couple of folks who are not sure. Thank you so much for responding to that. Um, we'll share those results up on the screen so you have them just real quick. So first, we want to take a minute to kind of talk a little bit about what some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that exist and come along with having a legacy society. So challenges. Um, first challenge that I've identified today is really this idea of inclusivity. So I think when it comes to legacy societies, we can awful, often fall into this trap of thinking of them as kind of this exclusive thing that maybe I don't have the, uh, I can't make a large enough gift to be involved in the legacy society at my church, or the folks who are in the legacy society at my church are not, um, uh, have much more wealth than I do. And I encourage churches when I'm talking to them to really think of their legacy society as an inclusive uh, environment. 
uh, invite anyone into your legacy society who has made provision for a gift in, in their estate plans or anyone who has made a current gift to uh, your endowment should be invited into that legacy society. Uh, the second challenge that we're identified and are gonna talk about today is this idea of connection. So making a meaningful connection, not just between yourself and those donors, but also helping those donors to see the connection between your endowment and your mission as a faith community. We often talk about the importance of tying your endowment to mission and what a opportunity you have to share the story of the work that you're able to do with your endowment and what your endowment enables. Um, so making that connection uh, can often be a challenge. I think well, a lot of times we fall into the trap or folks may fall into the trap of thinking of the endowment as just a way to kind of plug holes in the annual operating budget. And endowments have the potential to be so much more than uh, that and to really um, expand the way that we do mission and ministry. And then the third challenge that we wanna talk about and address today is the idea of value. So what is the value proposition for members of your legacy society? What do you as a faith community provide to members of your legacy society? Or what do you provide, provide to potential members of your legacy society? How do you work to bring people into the vision for your endowment, bring people into the vision that would make them want to give a gift to that legacy society. So we'll talk a little bit about that and maybe give some ideas and strategies about how you may present a good value proposition to your legacy society members and to potential donors uh, for, your, for your congregation. So where do the opportunities lie? I wanna talk a little bit about the current charitable landscape and maybe update and give you some figures on uh, what has happened. Obviously, a lot has changed over the last two and a half years. The church doesn't necessarily look the same as it did in even January of 2020. Obviously, we are uh, coming into this new phase of the global pandemic uh, where we're kind of, uh, COVID is here to stay with us and we're adapting and adjusting and uh, making changes to the way that we live and do church together as faith communities um, as a result of really the last two and a half years. So what has happened in the charitable landscape as a result of this? Well, I'm actually pleased to say that charitable giving is on the rise. Um, there has actually been a 7% increase in charitable giving since 2019. So throughout the global pandemic, uh, we actually did not see those numbers go down, but there has been, a, been an increase in the giving. And in that increase or in the broad charitable philanthrop philanthropic landscape, 27% of charitable gifts are made to religious entities like Episcopal churches or dioceses, camps and conference centers, whatever it may be. The other opportunity I want you to think about when talking about kind of the current state of affairs when it comes to giving is the idea of this transfer of wealth. We've been talking about this for many years. So it's anticipated that over the next several decades, um, about but somewhere between 30 and $68 trillion is going to transfer from generations, uh, existing generations, uh, baby boomers uh, to, millennials and Gen Z. Um, so what does that mean for your congregation? We're gonna talk a little bit today about some of the opportunities to reach out to and to connect with younger donors. The other opportunity we wanna discuss is the idea uh, of donor engagement. So churches are in a <coughs> excuse me churches are in a unique position um, when it comes to nonprofit organizations in that you have your donor base walking through your doors on a fairly regular basis. You have the opportunity to engage with your donors on a basis that is much more frequent and regular than say a uh, university or a hospital who is trying to uh, raise gifts uh, or other nonprofit organizations of that type. 
Um, you also have this idea of built-in community. There is already, as we alluded to, a very strong connection between your donors and your church. Um, they already feel like they are a part of your community. So taking advantage of opportunities to really connect and build upon that relationship um, is key to successful uh, this uh, successful endowment giving ministry. So let's talk a bit about some of the strategies for creating successful events. Um, and I want to just have a note here about the word event. Um, event uh, in this case is really kind of a, uh, we're not only going to providing you strategies for throwing parties or events to recognize and honor your legacy society. So when I talk about events today, what I'm really talking about is touch points between your faith community and its donors or its potential donors. So while some of the strategies may be ideas for actual specific events that you may put on at your church, some of them are also just about the ways that you connect and stay in relationship with those donors or potential donors. So First, I want to address that issue of value. We mentioned that one of the challenges that you come up against is the, is the value proposition for donors or potential donors. So what are some events or touch points that we can create that create opportunities to serve and educate donors or provide them with value that would otherwise not be there? One of the first things we've identified here and one of the first strategies we want to suggest to you is the idea of estate planning, a very simple, simple idea and something that comes immediately to mind when we're talking about planned giving and legacy societies. Um, so current statistics tell us that two out of three American adults don't actually have a will. And of those two out of three American adults, 60% of them haven't even started the process of beginning to draft or speak with the appropriate uh, advisors to put their will in place. So our first simple strategy for your faith community to think about is hosting something like an estate planning or an end of life event. Um, some churches uh, who I've worked with have called this kind of a, uh, a, a affairs fair or a, a end of life expo, whatever whatever type of uh, marketing name you'd like to come up with, but host a type of event where you invite people from your community, perhaps bring in some uh, estate planning attorneys who would be available to uh, consult with and uh, meet with folks in your congregation. The caveat here, the thing I want to make clear um, when you're inviting people in is that you want to avoid the idea of promoting any one specific person for services. So I would encourage you to invite a number of people and provide a number of different options or even provide a listing um, at your event of several attorneys in the area who could help with this. You may also invite people in from hospice care or from other uh, medical services to help talk about <coughs> medical directives with donors. Um, you would also, if you have uh, your legacy society, you would want to have information about giving opportunities there, plan giving opportunities for your faith community. So one real simple strategy that puts uh, provides some additional value to your donors that they may not otherwise have access to is this idea of hosting an estate planning or end of life event. The next, the next idea that we wanted to suggest that, uh, to, for addressing this challenge of value for donors is this idea of multi-generational giving. So it's a fact, families are redefining values and their philanthropic practices. Uh, we're talking more about finances and making gifts to charities with younger children or with our children as they're growing up. We're reconsidering our motivations for giving and how our philanthropy carries forth our values and our desire to impact our community uh, through, so, through social measures. Um, so one of the things you might consider doing is hosting or educating donors, families, on vehicles, on giving vehicles for multi-generational 
philanthropy. Um, I, I talked about this idea with the church recently, and they were really responsive to this. So thinking about something like donor advised funds, donor advised funds work similar to a charitable checking account where someone makes a gift and then uh, opens a donor advised fund from which they can recommend grants from their donor advice fund that goes to uh, individual charities. Um, the Episcopal Church Foundation actually offers donor advice fund to individual churches, and then those donors can make grants from their donor advice fund to their local congregation or other nonprofits that they wish to support. Donor advice funds are a great way to kind of use that to educate children um, about the opportunities for giving. So you could use this as a family tool for making grants from your donor advice fund to your congregation or other nonprofit entities that really reflect your values as a family. Um, the other wonderful thing about donor advice funds is many times you can name successor advisors. So if you um, are someone who opens a donor advice fund uh, and then the time comes where you wish to hand off the advisory uh, a role to your children or grandchildren, you have the ability to do that with this type of gift, gift vehicle. Um, so another poll question that we have for you before we transition into kind of this next uh, piece, which is going to address uh, some of the challenges related to inclusivity. So on this question, we wanted to ask a little bit about your social media use at your faith community. So does your faith community currently utilize social media as a part of its endowment fundraising strategy? See lots of folks coming in and it looks like, yeah. Give it just a couple more seconds. So results here are, um, uh, I think, actually not surprising. I'm not surprised to see that the majority of, our, of the folks and churches that we have on the call today do not utilize social media in their endowment fundraising strategy, about 78, almost 80% of those who have responded. Um, so a little bit about social media. Um, as we talk about fostering inclusivity with our uh, with our legacy societies through digital events. So social media, just a cute, quick, uh, few quick facts. So 72% of Americans actually utilize social media, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's using MySpace anymore, but that goes back to, <laughs> uh, I, I was a young person when MySpace was in vogue. Um, but 72% uh, of Americans, so the majority of Americans are utilizing social media. And I think that there's a great opportunity there for churches and faith communities to take advantage of that when marketing and talking about their endowment. The average social media user is on social media for two and a half hours per day. That is a pretty long period of time with a fairly engaged audience. I don't know if you've ever observed someone on social media on their phone in front of them, but they're pretty engaged. Um, so I think taking advantage of that, and it may surprise you to know that less than half of TikTok users are Gen Z. So it's not just the youngest of young hip cool kids who are using TikTok. There are other there are other folks out there using TikTok as well. So one of the more fun strategies that we wanted to throw out and suggest to you this I uh, today is this idea of TikTok testimonials. Um, so taking the challenge of social media and really turning it into an opportunity. You may be familiar with these viral TikTok challenges that are often going around, whether they're dance challenges, or I think back to the social media challenges of maybe, gosh, the ice bucket challenge was probably 10 years ago now. Um, but those kind of viral challenges where people are uh, putting a challenge out there and folks are recording themselves and uploading it to social media. I think there's a great opportunity here for faith communities to take advantage of this idea and do something uh, like asking their members of their legacy society to record a testimonial, just a short testimonial about why they chose to make a gift 
to your congregation or your faith community. Upload that and then share those out on your social media to help inspire other folks um, to think about their own, their own gift that they might make. Um, another way to think about fostering inclusivity is this idea of expansive reach. Um, so moving online over the last two and a half years, a lot of churches are utilizing uh, digital platforms for uh, worship for the first time and have uh, now kind of got that embedded into their regular community life. Think about how, what type of events you might do utilizing um, a digital platform. This is a great way. I personally, I live down in the state of Florida. We have a number of parishioners at many of our churches who are seasonal parishioners. Um, hosting digital events for your legacy society, online events would be a great way to bring those seasonal users into the fold. It also expands the pool from which you can invite guests. Let's say you wanted to do a uh, lecture or speaking opportunity, then you may have access to a guest who is on the other side of the country who you may not otherwise have access to if you do something through a virtual event. This also extends beyond virtual uh, beyond events. Um, it, uh, so thinking about uh, utilizing online giving as a way to uh, pull do donations into your endowment. Um, so data shows us that 60% of folks who are involved in church are willing to give to their church digitally. Um, churches that accept online donations actually saw an increase in overall donations by 32%. So putting in place the platforms so that someone can make a gift to your endowment fund through your website or through, you, some churches may have kiosks that you can do electronic giving. Um, so putting in place those systems for online giving help to expand and foster, again, foster inclusivity, expand the number of people that you can reach with your, uh, with your endowment. And then finally, quickly, uh, just making meaningful connections with people. So events that leave an impression on people, helping to, uh, again, address that issue of connecting with donors. Uh, we often hear that God loves a cheerful giver. So do your events, do your legacy society events, spark joy in your, in donor, in your donors? Does it inspire them to want to give uh, more or think about the purpose of, uh, of their gift and why they chose to make that? Do you tell a compelling story? Again, we talked about the connection between your endowment and uh, and uh, the, the story that you tell with that. And also just thinking about moving beyond this idea of luncheons, cocktail parties. Those are often the traditional events that come to mind when we think about um, legacy society events. I think if, if someone told me, well, if I asked a church, what do you do for your legacy society uh, event on an annual basis? I think the most common response would be, well, we host a luncheon or we host a dinner or a cocktail party. Um, and those are wonderful things to do, but I want to encourage you to think um, beyond that and think about some ways that you might uh, incorporate other ideas into in, into your legacy society. So just some real quick fire lightning round last minute strategies that you can walk away with. I'm sure we have some Episcopal schools on with us today or churches who have day schools connected to them. Um, Oftentimes, a handwritten note from the rector is a go-to uh, thank you for churches. I would also encourage those of you who work with schools, think about having your students write handwritten notes or cards around the holidays to your donors. Um, those, and I can say this because I am married to a rector, are probably much more meaningful than a note from the rector will be to receive a note from a student who is directly benefiting from the services that your school is providing providing to them. Or if you host a scholarship dinner, consider inviting your donors to that so they can hear the stories of the students who are benefiting from the gifts that those donors and the donors before them have made. Think about strategies beyond your walls. Don't just host events at your church. Think about doing outings or trips with your legacy society, um, whether that's local cultural events, museums, 
workshops, whatever it may be, think about going out beyond just the, the walls of the church and, and really thanking donors through those special opportunities um, that, that you can make available to them. Um, another great way to connect back to mission and what your endowment is making possible is to consider doing visits or volunteering with any outreach partners that you have. This really helps donors make a connection to the contribution that they and others have made to your endowment fund. If your endowment is uh, making possible uh, outreach uh, opportunities, then you should be incorporating that into everything you do with your endowment to, again, really tell that story. And on the subject of storytelling, um, our last idea or our last set of strategies that we wanted to give to you today is to, again, really incorporate the story of your endowment into what you do. Um, consider hosting a Legacy Society campfire where maybe you invite in a storyteller to tell stories around a fire, but also opening up and giving folks the opportunity to share their own stories. Again, talking, giving testimony about why they chose to make a gift to your congregation. Sing some campfire songs, share some s'mores, and really just invite people into an event that is going to uh, hopefully leave a memory with them, something that's just dinner than or different than another church dinner. Um, consider gifts, thank you gifts. Um, I am a big proponent of children's storybooks as gifts. I think that all of us have opportunities to learn from uh, the stories that we share with our children. So I think that uh, children's books are wonderful thank you gifts and have a lot to teach us as adults too. Um, or you may choose to build an entire uh, fundraising campaign around this idea of storytelling. Um, there's so much to be done with the theme um, and you and you could really build that up and really embed this into kind of a ongoing campaign that you have in your faith community. Um, the one thing I would say is to remember that there's no right or wrong way to host a Legacy Society event. You know your community. You are already in relationship with your donors. Think about what is going to create meaning and spark joy in your individual donors and in your congregation. And just real quick to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the tools and resources that are available to all of you on this call today through the Episcopal Church Foundation's Endowment Management Program. Growth through giving is just one of the things that we do when it comes to endowment management. We also work directly with churches on the area of endowment structure. We often say that a well-structured endowment is the foundation to any successful plan giving program, and we can help you review your own policies and procedures and governance documents. We have sample documents that we would be glad to share with you, and we can also review any drafts that you come up with. We also work to invest endowment and long-term investment assets, working with our partners at our investment partners um, at State Street Global Advisors. We manage uh, endowment and investment funds of about half a billion dollars for over 300 different faith communities throughout the, throughout the world. And we would be happy to talk with you and your uh, local leaders about investment opportunities that would be available to you. And when it comes to the area of growth, we have a number of resources available for endowment giving. Whether you're launching or relaunching your endowment for the first time, thinking about marketing your endowment, or looking for many of you, as we saw in our poll earlier, to start a legacy society for the first time. We have resources that can help you do that. We also have resources available to you and individual donors who are interested in learning more about gift opportunities, whether it be donor advised funds, charitable gift annuities, or other types of gifts. Um, we can certainly work directly with donors to uh, talk to them about opportunities uh, available to them to make gifts to your own uh, congregation. Just real quick, as we said, this is part one of a three-part series on endowment growth. All of these webinars will be 30 minutes long. Um, part two will be held on December 7th. That one is going to be focused on marketing your endowment and creating a communication strategy for 2023. And then the third part of our series is going to be on, uh, held in February of 2023. And we're going to have a panel, a Q&A panel with some development professionals, um, uh, director of development at, here at the Episcopal Church Foundation, as well as some staff from the Endowment Management Program who have done this type of development work, um, who, who have done development work in their own faith communities in the past.
As always, we are available to you um, at any time. Uh, you can contact us. We have our 800 number, our contact up here on the screen. You can also email endowment at ecf.org, and that goes to our entire team, and someone would be more than happy to uh, respond to your inquiry or any questions you may have. I recognize we're already five minutes over our allotted time, and we want to be mindful of that. So we will take a look at the questions that were uh, provided in the Q&A and, and get back to those individuals as, um, as necessary. We appreciate so much you taking the time this afternoon. This was a quick, really fast paced, drinking out of a, uh, you know, taking a drink out of a fire hose approach to uh, legacy societies. But I hope that you're able to walk away from this conversation um, with some ideas that you can take and put in place and put in practice at your own faith community. Again, please do feel free to reach out to us at any time. We'd be happy to provide you uh, any support and help to provide guidance uh, around these one uh, around these issues of endowment giving. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again in December. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care.